I'm Melanie Parker, Google's Chief Diversity Officer. Thank you for joining us for Equity Talks, part of our equity learner journey to more deeply examine and understand social injustice through dialogue. Greetings, my name is Kamal Bob. Uh, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Search for Racial Equity. Today we have the distinct honor and privilege of moving our conversation to South Africa. We have with us Mzamo Masito. He is a senior marketing professional in South Africa. He is an expert in multicultural communications and marketing. He also happens to be the chief marketing officer for Sub-Saharan Africa for Google. Mzamo, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, welcome to the discussion and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Kamal. Thanks a lot. Okay. Indeed. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So for full transparency, you and I have crossed paths before, uh, and I just have to uh, disclose that I'm a huge fan of yours. Uh, your attitude and position in the world is inspiring to me. So let me just lay that on the table up front. Uh, but for the rest of us, if you would start a little bit uh, with some introduction, and let me give you some context about what this introduction is. As you know, the search here is inspired by the challenges that we're facing in the United States, as you well know. Uh, and I think one of the interesting corollaries to some of the tensions that we're facing here is and has been the, the apartheid conflict in South Africa. Uh, I know it's a kind of a go-to subject, mm -hmm. but I think for people in my generation, it's, uh, it's arguably one of the most significant historical examples that are closest to what we're enduring now. So given that context that we're operating in, if you would introduce yourself, uh, where you're from and the timing relative to some of these historical events so that we can begin the conversation there. Ah. Once more, good day, everyone. Um, as I've said, my name is Mzamo, and my name really means to try. In my language, it actually means life is Mzamo, so which basically means life is to try. Not to win, not to lose, just to make an effort and the win and the lose is a bonus and i was born unfortunately i was born at the time when apartheid was still alive and kicking and was strong and i was born in the early 70s when apartheid was at its um, height and i was born at a time closer to the june 16 1976 riots where the students were killed in hundreds of numbers by the police for boycotting and protesting against um, being taught in Afrikaans instead of mother tongue and being taught an education system that was designed to make us slaves. It was called Bantu education. So I was born at a time when you still had the benches and chairs that whites only, blacks only. Um, you couldn't go to town at a certain time, you had a curfew. You had to leave at a certain time or you had to have a passport from your master or a license or a paper from your master that allows you to be in a white zoned place if you're black. And I was born at a time when my grandfather lost land three times and um, being taken illegally from him to be given to someone else who didn't work for it. So I am I am a product of being born in the times of segregation rather than some people intellectualize segregation or because they were not born in it. It was kind of, um, at some point it ended legally, not ended socially, institutionally, but legally at some point it ended. But I was born at a time when it was legal to be, um, to think that you are superior as a white person and you to think that a black person is inferior. And so when I, we only got our independence really in 1994. So from 1994 to now, we still have huge racial inequalities, income, wealth, gender, you name it, spatial planning, geography, where whites stay, where blacks stay. You can even see it to this day. You can, you can cut poverty, income, wealth by race easily in this country and and still institutionalized. The CEOs of all the major listed companies, predominantly are white male, 
after 20 plus years of democracy, political democracy, which most people say that we got political democracy, but we didn't get real democracy and the real freedom, which normally comes with economic freedom and mental freedom. So we're still in search of economic freedom and mental freedom, but we're also still in search of true political freedom, where truly black people genuinely are politically free and making decisions for themselves. So when Black Lives Matter happens in the US, I've been fortunate enough that I've been in the US at an age 16, 17, so I, and it was late 90s. So when it happened, I, I had a context in the sense that it had happened to me. I was chased by the police, saying I lived in Washington DC in a place called Tenley Town, and it was a white suburb. And every time I walked to American University, to university, I got stopped. And sometimes I got stopped by the same police. And it's weird that the same person doesn't see you, which is clear that they don't see me, they just see black. And they will stop and ask me the same questions to a point that I had to carry my passport with me every day so that I can be able to produce my passport, which is no different from being in South Africa, where you had to carry a passport or something called a DOM pass, which is kind of a pass that allows you to show that you, you are allowed to enter. And so I used to do that. So that's in the early 90s. So, and on top of it, I remember going to Anacostia in, in Washington, D.C., where mostly only black people stay and very poor. And that kind of poverty I can relate to because I grew up in it. I grew up in projects. I grew up in shacks. I grew up in drug, gangster. Me, myself, I was stabbed more than three times. So I know that pain of gunshots, stabbings, drugs. Me, myself, unfortunately, something I'm not proud of. For a week or two, I did sell drugs with my friends. Like, fortunately, my father helped me out of that. So I'm glad he did. He rescued me, my stepfather. And so when these Black Lives Matters happened in the US again, so I'm gonna say again, because for me, African Americans have been lynched for centuries. Like it just, it just takes different forms of lynching and different forms of discrimination, but it never ends, it hasn't ended. So when I use the word again, when it happens again, because this is not the first person to be shot by the police or killed by the police, or it just took me back to 19, early 90s, late 90s, and then it took me back to South Africa on how things are just not changing and they are moving slow, not even evolution. If there's another word for evolution, it will be a slower version of an evolution. It's just slow. And then it just shows me how human beings don't like change and, and human beings genuinely don't like change. On that theme, I appreciate that. The, a couple of things that you said there I find fascinating. One of which is that you yourself were born into this segregation. So it's not an intellectual exercise for you. So for people like me, I, I was born in 72, four years after the ass assassination of uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, but what's interesting is that I've never lived in that kind of legalized, mandated, armed and armed uh, military enforced segregation. But what you're saying now at the end about change being slow, we're in a process now of trying to reconcile all of this tension. Uh, that's, you know, the, the fact that we're having this conversation is born in part out of that. If you personalize it a little bit, I, I need some help personally, and I think your insights would be helpful here on what it, what it means to reconcile. If, if you're coming out of that particular period yourself, the rage, the vengeance, the historical animus, all of those things have to be burning in you personally. Uh, and then clearly, we, I mean, from this point of view, we've seen the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions and so on. But how does that translate to you as an individual? How, how do you spiritually reconcile with people who have been you know, uh, stealing your humanity for centuries? I like the point you make on that. For me, it's either now I'm saying fortunate in that I got to live in a place where I don't have to intellectualize pain. I know how it feels like to be excluded. 
by someone who sees you as inferior and you don't exist. And I, I know that deeply and I know the head and I know the head of poverty, that poverty stands cognitive development, spiritual development. It's poverty is actually painful. And people over intellectualize and glorify poverty. Poverty is painful. And it really, it is better to seriously cry in a Mercedes with an aircon than cry in a shack I grew up in. So it is really painful. So when I saw my grandfather, for example, um, in 1994, and when we got the political freedom, democracy, he was still in pain and he died painfully, in pain and in sorrow because he lost land, which he worked hard for, and he never got it back. And one of the things I learned from that is that it is very difficult to reconcile when there's no restorative justice. It is very difficult to, to truly reconcile where there is no restorative justice. In my village, which I'll use an example, like which I know why my grandfather died hurt and angry, was that there was no restorative justice, which I see also in the US, that there's no restorative justice yet. And what does restorative justice look like in my family or in my village is that in my village, there's um, communal courts with the chief, a tribal chief, and a, sometimes a king, but a tribal chief in that village or a village chief. If I steal Kamal's cow, and for whatever reason I decide to slaughter it and do a bribe or eat it or sell it, then Kamal needs recourse. And, and what the community immediately understands is that if there is no peace between me and Kamal. There will never be balance in the community. And if Kamal is not restored to his peaceful state, there will never be peace in the community. So the community has been wise enough to understand this concept of balance and peace. A, now it's called sustainability. It's got a nice word now, environmental sustainability. But then it was called communal sustainability. How do you make sure that there's um, peace and sustainability in the community. So what they will then do is, they will both bring us to court, which is a village court administered by the village elders and the community. Everyone is there to judge who's guilty. And if I am found guilty, and I admit that I did steal your car, cow, I was hungry or for whatever reasons, then they will look for restorative justice. Then they'd say, I, don't, I can't give you the cow back. Now I don't have it, I don't have cows. And then they would say, okay, Nzamo, you're good at building huts and you're good at fixing grass roofs. Like in a hut, they're made of grass, but you're good at it, it's your trade, and it's your skill. So in exchange, Kamal's house is falling apart. For the next two years, you're gonna be fixing Kamal's house and you're gonna fix it properly at your expense and you're gonna fix it, and we as a village will come and supervise and monitor that it has been done well. And then on top of that, we would like you to offer an opportunity to apologize sincerely to Kamal in public and in private. The third thing, when you are done fixing the house, you're gonna throw a sogam beer ceremony that all of us as a community, more like a party, for all of us as a community to celebrate that we have now made peace. Then they will say to Kamal, Kamal, are you happy now with this um, the reparation? Then Kamal will say, yes, I'm happy, satisfied. Then they will say to Kamal, now that you are happy and you've been restored, we don't want you to ever again remind us what Mzamo has done to you. Because then you are not peaceful and you don't like balance and you don't like sustainability. Now, that's something villagers have been doing for centuries. And what we haven't done well in South Africa, in the rest of the world, where there's been racial injustices, you cannot take people out of their country as slaves and use them to build your own country. And then there is no restoration. There's no restorative justice. There's no reparation. There's no atonement and apology given, sincere one. And only another human being will know whether that apology is sincere or not. That doesn't need a scientific calculation or algorithm. We know when someone is being sincere or not. We've, God gave us a sensor.
to know that, that that's a sincere apology. And then after that, the person must be willing to give something. They must be willing to give something to truly demonstrate that they are really sorry and they want to make this right. And that hasn't happened in South Africa, nor has it happened in the US that people say, oh yes, racial equality is important, but I'm not willing to be inconvenienced mm -hmm. by it. So I want it, but I don't want the inconvenience. I want a rainbow nation. In South Africa, we talk about a rainbow nation, but those with privilege don't want to give anything or sacrifice anything to achieve the rainbow nation. So basically, you don't want it then. Because if you want something, you should also be willing to give and get. Same, for example, with black people in South Africa. For, for If black people agree that a non-racial society is a society we should all aim for, then even black people who've been pained and who've been hurt must also then come to the party and to the table and say, okay, for us to achieve this great ideal or end goal of a rainbow nation, what would we need to give? And then what would we need to sacrifice for us to achieve this long-term goal? And it might be things like, um, once I get reparations or once I get restorative justice, I need to move on. I need to take and trust and give benefit of doubt. I need to assume good intentions. I need to give radical candor feedback. I need to not immediately assume the worst about each person or different race. Now, that's something I'm giving. And also, I need to be ethical. If I'm a politician, I need to stop being corrupt and serve the citizens well. I, I need not to whistle, dog whistle for the master or for the colonial master and still oppress the Africans now on behalf of the colonial master. All of those things that even the blacks themselves have to give something, to get something. But also those that privilege have not yet come to the party to say, this is what I'm willing to give. This is in order to get the end state. And both parties, we're going to have to do the work. And we haven't been doing the work yet. Let me ask you a question. I, I find that assessment, as, as you can probably tell, fascinating. And I think one of them is that the, the, the slogans here are no justice, no peace. That's a slogan mm -hmm. that's universal. Everyone who's striving for freedom, liberation, justice, fairness, equality has that. But what's interesting about it is the order of operations. Justice mm -hmm. first, then peace. And the restorative justice that you just laid out to me is that. But this last point that you're making, I, I want to relate it back to the original point that you said. You were born in pain yourself. You know what it mm -hmm. feels like. It's not an intellectual pursuit. The idea of people of privilege having to be inconvenienced to reconcile and to apologize and to be restorative is also to some extent speaking for myself, it's a bit theoretical. I don't know personally what it is to be white, to experience this, this idea of white privilege, et cetera. But on my side of this equation, where you articulate that Black people have to give too, I wonder your thought about what it means to trust. In order for me to give, I have to trust that the system works, that the, that the dynamic will work. But I don't have any evidence that suggests that when I lay my burden down, it won't be thrown back in my face. I won't be assaulted. I won't be taken advantage of. Where does that trust come from? Well, at the moment, when I looked at my granddad and my mother, I think what helps is though we've been lucky in that because we grew up and steeped in religion and spirituality, ancestors or religion, I think there's a part of it that comes there because you're just going to have to have faith. It's just faith. It's not even trust. I think trust is even just harder. Faith is just, I just have to have faith that the person will do right by me. I, I have to have that faith or else we can't move forward. I might learn to trust you because very few human beings, I'm kind of my personality, I'm one of those people when I meet you, I started 100% trust. But what I've observed is that probably majority of the people start at zero or minus. You are in an overdraft and you earn your way to 100. 
and I started 100 and you deduct your way to zero. So it's very different, but I consider the first part of our relationship is faith. It's, it's not trust. It's founded on faith. I have to, or else, how do I have a relationship with people who've raped, molested, killed, excluded, made us landless, call us kefir, baboons, monkeys, who still believe, some of them, that they are racially superior to me and I'm inferior, I'm not smart. So how do I do that if I cannot look at the person and know that the reason they think I'm inferior is because racism and prejudice is a mental illness. They are not well. So I have to come at it at, a, at an empathetic point that says, this person is not well. They need help. Because if I don't come at it in that angle, then it's fire with fire, eye for an eye, who lives in the Old Testament. And then you have the one who lives in the New Testament. And you need both the New Testament and the Old Testament to bring about change. Because the Old Testament beliefs and values <coughs> will put some of the people who have privilege to change faster. Because you don't want to be hanging with people who have disadvantaged you, but they feel comfortable around you. Because that's another thing for me I've learned over time is that when people with privilege are overly comfortable around me, it's also a signal to me that maybe I'm setting out. Maybe I am not, I don't have parts of Old Testament in me. Maybe I'm not calling things out. Maybe I'm not practicing radical candor. Maybe I'm actually kissing ass. Maybe I'm brown nosing myself. So I'm a believer that the trust thing for me starts with faith. You just have to get on with faith. And fortunately, we have enough of that in our veins because how else did we get over all of these 500 years without faith? So we start with what we know best our ancestors have given us because they've survived mostly not just out of sheer genius and God, but also faith. And then we move it into trust over time through work and we working with each other. And so I think that it will be faith and then slowly to trust. The substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. <laughs> Do me a quick, and just a quick interim here. You used Malcolm X and Martin Luther King as the examples of the fire and the water, the Old Testament and the New. Uh, but also just for, for education's sake, uh, you're referencing U.S. icons that I know instinctively in my blood. Who would the analogous fire and water be in the South African context? In a South African context, for example, you will have a Steve Beagle or Robert Sobuka versus Mandela. Mm. So Mandela is the global icon that the West loves, <clears throat> partly because he doesn't rub the West the wrong way. He's kind of nicer, more easier to the eye or to the heart of privilege. He's, he's not asking for a lot. And he's not asking, whereas you then have Robert Sobuka who's saying Africa for Africans. And then he's saying, we will first take our land, we will nationalize, then you can still stay. We are not saying no to white people or any other race being in Africa, but you will stay in our terms. You can't dictate to us what to do. Then you have Mandela say, no, Rainbow Nation, nine racial society, don't worry, we forgive all sins, we cool with you. You don't even have to give us anything. The other side says, no way. You can't do all of this stuff for 450, 500 years and get out of it scot-free. You cannot make God someone you included in your evil and get away with it. Even in God's world, you can't get away with it. God is justice, mercy, and compassion. And we want justice. And the other side, Mandela is all about compassion and mercy. The other one is like, yes, I want compassion and mercy, but I also want justice. Mm -hmm. So now you have this friction in Robert Sobukwe, Steve Biko versus Mandel. The unfortunate thing that happened with South Africa is that Robert Sobukwe, Steve Biko was assassinated. And Robert Sobukwe was arrested in prison in Robben Island for years and he died. And we were only left with a Mandel. So we didn't have a proper polarization even within the black community to show that black people are not a homogeneous group. 
not everyone in South Africa is Mandela. There are many variations in there. There's Mandela and there's Robert Sobuko. There's Steve Biko. Maybe Steve Biko is in the middle, or maybe he's closer to Robert Sobuko. Then there's Mandela. Then there's other, there's Chris Hani. Maybe he's in the middle, or he's closer to Mandela. Then there's uh, Winnie Mandela, who was uh, Mandela's wife, who might be in the middle far away from Mandela, but also not close to Robert Sobuk. You have this variation or, or continuum of black people that also needs to show up when we talk about search for racial equity, that you are not gonna have a one homogeneous monolithic segment of black people. Just as much as black people also have the seven primal psychological emotions, we, we also have them, so we also have to demonstrate them. There must be angry blacks, just as much as there must be Zen-like peaceful blacks. But we can't all be expected to be Buddhist monks, Zenish, and just <laughs> meditating all the time. There must be the ones who are just pissed off and angry and, and just irritated and irritable. I see that, and I welcome that because you need it. Because you need that polarization, even within the white community, so that we can all get to the center. Because what we all need is the center. We need some pragmatism so that we can meet each other in the center, pulled by the polar opposites to the center. Because either way, it's not healthy. To go the triple KKK route, that's unhealthy. It's unstable <laughs> in the long run. To go only Mandela route, that's emotionally and psychologically and spiritually has proven in South Africa not to be the best model either because it's just not pragmatic and it doesn't take into account of restorative justice. So you, it's kind of like, for me, those would be the examples. It's like the people that are at the back of my video, those are my people. I mean, that, if you see that, that's Thomas Sankara, Franz Fanon, Robert Sobukwe. These are the people for me, I consider would have been on the, Man, not on the Mandela side. They will be more on another spectrum of Mandela. Because I'm, I believe that black people are not a homogeneous group and they have this continuum, like I've said, from Mandela to Sobukwe to Steve Biko, what I've sensed and I've seen even in the US or I've seen in Brazil or in the UK is that the, the black that is most comfortable to white people is Mandela-like black. And because he's just comfortable and it's easy to privilege and privilege doesn't feel like they have to give up much. They only give up what they are comfortable to give up. Whereas then there's the side of black, which is Robert Sobuk, which gets considered angry, black, radical, controversial. And that side makes white people nervous. And that side makes white people angry. And that side makes white people, as if like black people cannot have a range of emotions. You can only be happy, but you cannot be angry. As soon as you get, you show anger, then people run away. But when you're always smiling, what kind of human being am I? That doesn't, I mean, I have seven primal emotions that exist in everyone, coded in our DNA. How can I not be angry sometimes? And I do need that angry black just as much as I need that meditating, happy, always happy Zen black who's always peaceful. And I need both. Same with white people. I need both the extremes. And, and hopefully the, the sensible people on both sides will get to the center. And anyway, there will be more of us than the extremes, than the outliers. And we're the ones who can then lead and run the world and the country. <laughs> what I like about that is, I think that the sophistication and the, and the heterogeneity is, uh, you know, blocking people into this kind of homogeneous cast is uh it's constraining it's dehumanizing but the point that you make which is again part of the, the momentum for all of this is that when black people again here in the states demonstrate anger the response of the state is to clamp down with vicious antagonism so the expectation is that we just have to be compliant by default and any other any other way of operating is criminal and we've been labeled as such what I would like for you to do is in that spirit of radical candor, as you called it, which I really appreciate, 
let's let's transition here a little bit into the to the to the space that we're in. So we're obviously uh, operating in a moment now, kind of in historical uh, context, where the economic engines of the world are driven principally by tech innovations in various sectors. Uh, you're a marketer. Uh, you're also uh, an expert in multicultural communications, and now we have. Uh, a tech sector which, again, stereotypically is centered as the intellectual origins coming from the United States uh, and Asia. And as you said at the very beginning, when you were personalizing the relationship that you have yourself with your own country, there is a, a kind of a devaluation of your own intellect, the devaluation of your creativity, of your innovation. It's not assumed that Black people participate in this kind of uh, milieu. So start with that where where does africa where does south africa where does cape town where does where do you play uh in your view of the relationship between this new uh economic engine and the role that africa plays in it in south africa is i would say in south africa it can be split in that you have the privileged group which is kind of predominantly white in south africa which has tech hubs ICT, very innovative um, thought leadership on tech. And they also likely had a great education system that promotes STEM, that promotes computer science coding. Then you have this disparity of the black population and colored, because South Africa is split into four um, races, because that was the race pyramid in this country. You white, Asian or Indian Chinese, colored, then black. The bottom of the ladder of the pyramid was black, then colored. So the most excluded races in South Africa, economically, academically, education, and tech, or even ICT or mobile access is colored and black. Colored in South Africa is mixed race. And I know that in other countries using such terms is um, politically incorrect, but we're talking about South Africa context here, yeah, it's legal and not politically incorrect. And also you will be whitewashing history to try and act like they didn't exist. We will stop using them when we found equality. We are in search of racial equity now. When we find it, we'll find new words. But for now, <laughs> we will use them until we have new words. So we're not gonna whitewash history and act like we are already in equity when we're not. So let's, let's not lie with, to ourselves. So then what you find is that in South Africa, the black colored population, which is the majority, 90% of South Africa's population is black and colored. That's the population that is being left behind. And it's partly being left behind because of the 450, 500 years of exclusion, poor education, poor nutrition, all of those things, and then the education system is still dismal, and it hasn't significantly improved for the black child. Now you have white and Indian and Chinese who have far more better education and who are a lot more beneficiaries of the new world or information age or tech world, who are more beneficiaries of this system. So we still have a huge disparity. Then if you add intersectionality in it, Black women will even be furthest behind. Now you have black women furthest behind. If you add another intersectionality, if you're a black woman with a disability, you're even furthest, way furthest. Then if you add another dimension of black women LGBTQ, then you even pushed backwards even more. So it gets worse. And the only consistent a uh, variable across all of them is the skin color. And that's what makes it worse. So even in the ICT world, I would say that the people who are really behind, I mean, if you look at the continent of Africa as a whole, 800 million Africans are still offline. 800 million. The world says 50% of the world is online. That's what the data tells us. But I can tell you that if you have 1.2 or 1.1 billion Africans, 800 million plus are still offline. We are only talking about 300 million Africans that are online. And in that 300 million Africans that are online, the majority of them have basic phones. They have phones that still have storage issues, battery issues, 
They have electricity issues because your phone and electricity go together. And clean water is a challenge. Flushing toilets are a challenge. So you still have people who are still seriously not even talking about information age. They have not yet caught up even with the things that in the industrial age are considered basic amenities now. And so you have people who are fighting to get the basic amenities, but they are also fighting to get into the information age. So it's, it's, it's kind of an endemic, more than a pandemic. It's an endemic of many things all in one in South Africa and the rest of the continent. So there's, there's still a long way to go. I think it's root solution is in education. It's a root solution is in education and is an education that where we are able to democratize the quality of education for everyone. Where that's where I see tech playing a huge role in that we can democratize the best teacher through a hologram or through search or through YouTube or through Google Classroom or through G Suite. We can democratize and through Chromebook and everything that we have, cloud, everything that we have even within Google in partnership with others, I don't think we can do this alone. Google on its own can't do it. Facebook on its own or Microsoft on its own. This is one area where partnerships or different business models will be required if we're gonna fix something that is a 500 year, 400 year problem. And so for me, way behind, we, I'm optimistic because I see positive signs. I mean, look at me, I came from poverty and now I'm at Google. So things do change, but I, I'm like 0 0.00 something. So it's a number I'm not proud of. It, we're not normal yet. And I want us to get to normal and the data must get to normal. Go in for this a little bit for me. It's, I, I think what you're saying is that when we lay out the, the, the glaring disparities as you just did, it also reinforces that negative stereotype that's lingering out there in the world. So it's a, it's a vicious cycle. And so the, the, the stereotypical image, as you well know, of Africa, I mean, even the, the, the education that we get, even as black people in the United States and often in the Caribbean too, uh, of Africa is basically slavery, colonization, uh, you know, yeah. Rwanda, <laughs> and then Nelson Mandela, or Nelson Mandela and then Rwanda, and that's basically about it. And when we have that kind of, uh, kind of in virtuous cycle going on. What do you think is, is necessary? The kind of tech involvement, uh, um, industrial development, industrial presence, industrial mandates that are necessary to transform that, to democratize education, to democratize uh, opportunity, as you say. Do you think that it's necessary to kind of leap in, uh, even though those challenges are there where you know, industrial decision makers may say that these problems are too far gone and I can't necessarily benefit from having been there. What's, what's the way that uh, we go forward from that? I think we should, I like, there's a program on the j -Paw. I think it's called j -Paw, and the three Nobel Prize economists, they talk a lot about randomized trials and they talk a lot about trials. And the only thing I learned from, one of the things I learned from that is you just experiment in go, you do shit loads of stuff and not everything's going to work. Mm -hmm. And we know that, I know this because I joined Google because the mission says, organize the world's information, make it universally accessible and useful. It says the world information. You, and then it uses the last word universally accessible. So I know that mission is incomplete without Africans leaving that mission or experiencing that mission. And I know the company still has a lot of work in making sure that mission is truly global. And I know most companies think that way as well, that this is not a charity job. This is a, a profit for good or good while making profit job. No one is saying that we shouldn't be making money while doing good. It's just that what I'm seeing is that some people forget that even in their own countries, what they are now benefiting from is work done by others before them, which took 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. Now it feels like we are creatures of amnesia and we have weak memory. 
And we don't have long-term memory. We have very weak memory. It's like one year, three year animal memory. But we should understand that when we send West Africans or South Africans to the UK or Nigeria, and they're the top performing students, some of the top performing people in the US or black are, are Nigerians or West Africans, that already should tell you that the brains are there. So the issue is not IQ. So if anyone wants to say, oh no, they're not smart, then we please explain why you have a bunch of strong Africans outside Africa doing well and even leading blue chip companies and doing well at university or even the top Ivy Leagues, they're doing well. So immediately that tells us that IQ is not the issue here. The issue here is the willingness to play a long game and the willingness to have patience capital. And you need patient capital and you need to play a long game. And the long game is you get in, we start at primary, high school, university. We know that the return on investment of education is over 12 to 18 years payback. You only get payback after 20 something years. You don't get it the first 20 years anyway. Even with parents, if you're a parent, you know, you raise your kids, they are your problem for 25 years. Worse now these days, stay at home till age 30. So they are a problem till age 30. So why can't you have that same mindset when it comes to developing other countries? Is that they just, it's a 30 year class and companies are on horizons anyway. So this is a horizon two or three growth plan. And it's possible, it just requires um, patient capital and playing a long game. What about this? I want to kind of round us out here towards the end. The role that you actually play in terms of marketing, not, not necessarily specifically your current job, but more broadly, your, your, your marketing on behalf of big global international companies in the African context. That means that you're, you're, you're brokering, I think. If we go back to the theme that you articulated before, if we're talking about what restorative justice means, I could in my mind, I could take a set of those industries and make an analogous jump to the kind of exploitation that has happened in other countries. And I'm not accusing any of those countries of having done so, but uh, companies rather, but the relationship between big, powerful international conglomerates and the African continent itself has a history of that kind of behavior. And so when you are a marketer, it seems that you're, you're, you're brokering between people who have been put upon versus those who have taken from them. Uh, and the trust that you spoke about before seems like the thing that you are trying to help develop, uh, develop, perhaps through a process of faith, I don't know. But speak a little bit about the, the way that you think your role operates in that context. So my role, I, I see it because I'm a storyteller and human beings are addicted to stories and they're hungry for stories, and they love stories. And stories are the things we've been telling for millions of years since we've been on this earth. So I'm in a discipline that is all about storytelling. And to top it all, I'm so lucky I'm an African, so I grew up in storytelling. We grew up in storytelling. So they, they kind of jump as a marketing, as a discipline, is actually, it's storytelling. So the way I see it then is, my job is to tell stories about the continent to the outside world, but, but also like, for example, if I'm at Google, I'm trying to make Google relevant to Africa while making Africa relevant to Google. How do we do that? We have to tell stories. We have to tell stories about Africa. And we also have to tell stories that do not appeal to sympathy, but appeal to interest. And if Google's interest are aligned with Africa's story, then we build a bridge. And same when I worked at Unilever, when I worked at Nike, all of my job was to tell stories that are African centric, that when I use those stories, they will bridge the gap between Nike in the US and Nike in South Africa or Nike in Nigeria, but also my role is also realizing that the African stories also matter. So my job is not to copy paste 
a European or US or Japanese or Brazilian stories into Africa. My job is to acknowledge that the African stories matter. They can actually build the brand. They can actually r r touch heart. And because when I tell African stories, I'm talking to the heart. When I tell an American story, I'm talking to the head. And so when I combine the two, maybe then the head and the heart will meet somewhere. And then the gut might be the thing that entertains us all. So you just never know that. So I'm a believer that while I'm here as a marketeer, the, the magic is in the storytelling. But my role is to tell African stories while also globalizing. Because there are similarities. Even Africans are not that significantly different from the rest of the world. There are things where we are common. And so my job is to be able also willing to steal with pride that which is common. And I can see it's working in the US and I can bring it into South Africa. For example, recently I saw this campaign in the US of most searched campaign for Black History Month. That campaign is amazing. All I need to do is just replace the black characters, some of them, which don't resonate with Africans, with African black characters, male and female, and I have the same campaign. The big idea is the same. The only thing now to build a bridge is that I need to be able to take that campaign and infuse African imagery and stories in it. But the big idea is global, it travels. So I need to also have that flexibility as a marketeer and an African not to be fixed minded, to have a growth mindset that I can see something that works in the UK and be able to apply it in a way that will resonate with Africans. But also the, the African thing as well is that I also need to remember myself that Africa has 54 countries and Africa is not a homogeneous group. So when I say something that resonates in Nigeria, I must also be aware that when I do something in Nigeria, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will appeal in Congo. It doesn't mean it will appeal in South Africa or Namibia or Ghana or Kenya because even Africans themselves in those 54 countries are not a homogeneous group. But they are, they have things that are common, but they also have things that are different. So I'm juggling the external world outside the continent, but I'm also juggling multiple worlds within the continent in making sure I respect Nigerians, I respect Kenyans, but I also sell an African story sometimes. And sometimes I sell a nationalistic story and sometimes even within Nigeria, you have to sell a geographical story because there's tribes, there's regions, there's religion, there's different things that exist even there. So it's um, the way I see it is we're in a beautiful space where my role is really to tell the most compelling moving story that will allow a company like Google or Nike or Unilever to be relevant to Africa and come and invest more, invest more headcount, invest more resources, make the products relevant to the Africans. And the last part for me is I'm trying to bridge a gap where, for example, if Africans are communal and we are more likely to ask the person next door and we, when I meet you, which is something I love with black people most, even when I'm in the US, if I meet a black person, whether I don't know you from a bar, so like, hi, next thing we look like we're friends. And someone who's from the other side will be like, do you know each other? No, we just met. But that's just in our DNA. Maybe that's what our forefathers and foremothers passed on to us. So that is something that technology should not take away. That is something that technology should embrace. Therefore, we should, if we should build for people and embrace the people, not necessarily the product. The product should be an enabler. The hero should be the person's culture and values. So my role in it as well is to make sure that we don't introduce another neo-tech colonization into Africans by now forcing them to assimilate to an existing product that does not respect their culture, that does not respect their way of being, that does not respect their language. So the, the product has to bend as well to the people's culture, values, the way they see life, the way they visualize things, the way they talk, the language, the way their voices, their accent, all of that, I need to make sure 
That's my role. That's where I come in and make sure that Google doesn't get it wrong. That's where I come in when I worked at Nike and make sure that I can demonstrate to Nike that the football Africans play is probably closer to the football Brazilians play soccer, but it might not be close to the football Europeans play. So that's my role, but it's still football. But how we do it will have to be sensitive and bend to a people's way of being and not force people to change because that's just another colonization in a different form. The, needless to say, I, I find your point fascinating and powerful. This, this last thing that you just said though about kind of a, a, a technical neo-colonization process where we're forced to fit into a technical uh, infrastructure or ecosystem as it were and sacrifice the kind of spiritual and com communal legacies that we have. What do you think about this? If we have, uh, now just come back with me just for a second, with the diversity goals that, that kind of are pervasive across the industry, the, the, the representational goals are typically about the, the proportions of people that exist in these various companies. And one of the principal arguments for that is to ensure that the, that the outcome of these companies are reflective of the inputs of those very people. So that we have to have a diversity of people, a diversity of experiences, all of those arguments that you already know. But given the disproportionate access to the high quality education that you referred to before, it's going to be a very long time before there's anything close to parity with the group of people. Let's keep in the, in the South African context, for example, uh, the percentages you said about 90% of the black and colored people are mm. of the population, but are also largely left out. So as the tech infrastructure in South Africa grows, and there's clearly going to be a lag between the, the representation of those groups of people into the technical infrastructure and machinery as it grows, will the people who are contributing to the way the tech engine works be able to incorporate that communal spirit, that resonance with the existent uh, traditions and landscape? I, I, do you think that they're versatile enough to do that? Or do we just have to wait until this other group of people is really participating? I, I see it as end end instead of either or. The end end part is that we cannot fix centuries of problems in two years. So we have to make peace with this, that this is not something that's going to happen overnight. It's going to take time. What it then means is that while we are trying to create opportunity, equal opportunity and equal access, I am not, for, I'm not a proponent or believer of equal outcomes. I'm a believer of equal access and equal opportunity because the cream always rises to the top anyway. So I'm, I'm really more about equal access and equal opportunity. While we're still working on equal access and opportunity, like for example, recruitment, who comes into Google, who comes into these multinationals or in these companies in South Africa, while we're sorting that out, the next phase as well is the people who are inside, are they doing enough education themselves to change? Are they building empathy? Are they educating themselves on the political, historical, legal context of why change is needed? So that when they start building things, even though there's a minority of the underrepresented group there, because they are sensitized that empathy, they will still go out to, to ask. They will still go out to make sure that it's inclusive. They will still do the work while, so it's an end in that you need the people who have privilege to also do the work, to educate themselves and to build the empathy to understand that the products that they're building have bias, which is their bias, not the product. The algorithm itself is not biased. The person who's coding or building the product, the marketer, the product, the engineer, the UX person, all of these, it's us who are infusing our bias into technology. So we're the ones who need to fix ourselves, not necessarily the technology itself. So then if we fix our biases, or at least we are aware of them, we manage them, while we're also getting the numbers in, I think over time, 
we will achieve this rainbow-like feel nation or rainbow-like company over time, but it's an end end for me. And I think the, the, the win is for now, because the one of getting numbers in will be slower, you then need to fix inside, clean the house, make sure you clean the house of the people that are already inside and weed out the ones who are refusing to change. And that's another thing we want to have to do. We cannot say we want change and then we're willing to let the wheat grow. If we want a pristine grass, it also requires us we weed at certain things out. We, so we're going to have to be willing inside to weed out those who are poisoning the grass or those who are making the garden not beautiful, those who are choking the beautiful garden we're trying to create. We weed them out. And that's the work we do inside. Then we do the training. We put the manure which is the education. We do the work in growing what is inside to make it more soulful and woke and awakened. And then we bring the numbers in. So we're going to have to do it both. And then the last piece is that we go outside to become part of the solution. Because we know that we need more STEM. Now, how do we get to the education system in South Africa, for example, and become part of the solution in helping fix it? If we have less coders, less developers, if we have less black women in STEM, what is our contribution in fixing it at the root? Not at recruitment only, but now we go to the root, which is primary education. We know that most kids, there's a studies that are clearly show that by the time you get to age six, your stunting or your development is there. Your neurons have fired all the way up to age six. So if we can catch you early, right around about six to 12 years old or 10 years old, we have a far greater chance of producing a great human being who can create another Google. But if we catch you at 22, we might be late. Like in sport, because I love sport and I work for Nike, the, the, the great footballers or soccer players, they are found at age 10, eight, nine, because you can still mold. In my culture, we have a thing that says, you bend the tree while it's still young to get the shape you want. You're not gonna bend a fully grown 22 year old with full teeth into the shape that you want when they already have biases and you know, God knows what else they have with them that they've learned from their parents and community at school, at church. So that's, for me, it will be what you say now, it will be fix the house, our own house, get it in order, take out the weed, put in the manure, which is education, feed, the people inside, give them history, education, political education, consciousness, why this thing matters. Help them create stories that help them. Like I attended this thing called Digital Human Week One and like why it matters. What Lorraine is doing with us as a marketing team, why it matters. Conscientize us, educate us. That's doing the work inside. We go outside, fix recruitment, make sure recruitment is fair, less biases, career progression, path, all of those things, we do the work. Then we go to the root, which might not be, it's not necessarily our primary core business, but if we don't go there to the root, we're not gonna fix the entire value chain. So we go to the root and become part of the solution. What are we doing? Restorative justice. What are we doing? We are being a relevant, responsible citizen. And what are we doing? Culture, that's Ubuntu. In my culture, that's what we call Ubuntu. I am because we are. A human being, a person is a person because of others. Google is only Google because of others. It, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. Same with all the other global multinational or companies that were founded here in South Africa. It's a symbiosis between society and the company. And if we're not doing that, then we're And Zamo Masito, you have ended us here with a poem, it seems. One, to put our flag in the ground and make sure that we have the beautiful garden and we have to take a stand. I really, really appreciate your contribution to the search for racial equity. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you, brother. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. Learn about Google's equity learner journey on diversity.google.com and sign up to learn about new episodes.